Welcome to part three of the Scale Forum 2024 report. The report for the Sports Hall has been split into two sections, parts three and four, as there is so much to see. In this part, we will wander round the first half of the Sports Hall, clockwise along the left side and then along the top. But before we do, we should just take a look at the demonstration of battery-powered radio control systems by Ted Scannell and Tony McSween on the balcony, showing samples of various battery and receiver types that can be fitted in the limited space available in a 4mm locomotive. With Ted enthusiastically discussing and promoting the system with anyone who has a few minutes to spare. Immediately on the left, as we enter the hall, there was the Blacksmith's model stand. They had on display various kits and models in their range, including this rather fine GWR Auto Coach number 207, built by Nick Allport. The next stand along was Branch Lines, showing their range of coach kits and Newcast Loco kits as well as providing a wide range of components. Next in line was Missenden Abbey, offering short courses in all aspects of model railways. From rolling stock construction and painting to assembling electronic systems. We now come to the Brainert Sidings layout. Brainert Siding is a shunting puzzle layout. Too much stock, not enough space. This layout is about providing a bit of entertainment. Visitors are invited to have a go. That said, the layout is P4 and has some excellent modelling. The track plan is quite complex, with a loop and various sidings intersecting one another. These are a bit tight on space, perhaps accommodating a loco plus a couple of wagons. All part of the challenge. The site is very constrained and stretches the limits of what can be run on P4 track. Buildings represent those that may be found on any typical industrial site with various warehouses and stores. And of course Enigma Engineering, whose slogan is what we make is a mystery. Coupling and uncoupling is manual with Dingham couplings allowing wagons to be uncoupled, then propelled into sidings. The puzzle is set by shuffling cards, which have destinations and a list of stock items to be moved. Now let's take a ringside view and watch someone trying their hand at shunting, albeit speeded up a little. After a few minutes of this, the layout lives up to its name, and the brain hurts. What a great name for a shunting puzzle layout. Just along the way was the CNL fine scale track building systems, with Phil demonstrating turnout construction. Also on show were various ranges of RTR models and kits to tempt the modeler. James Walters and John Jones were next, demonstrating 3D printed plug track construction using Templot. They also showed other examples of 3D printed models for rolling stock. Their demonstrations generated much interest. They also brought along with them an FDM printer, that is fused deposition modeling, which was an endless source of fascination as it quietly produced components. 
and here are some of the completed parts, albeit 7mm scale. The mushroom things behind are plug track chairs. Moving along, regrouping railways had their range of kits on display, offering models of early railway wagons and coaches. In the corner of the hall was the Southwestern Circle stand, and new this year, their monograph book on Southwark Bridge, a large P4 layout of a hypothetical London terminus, built by the Southampton Area Group of the Society. At the end of the hall was the bring and buy stall, with everyone looking for a bargain. Moving to the central area at the far end of the hall, there was the Blackfriars Bridge layout. Many viewers of this show report will have read the write-up for Blackfriars Bridge in Scale 4 News 239, which gives plenty of detail about the layout and its historical background. However, a brief potted history for those who haven't seen this. The layout represents what was briefly a through station called Blackfriars Bridge, belonging to the London Chatham and Dover Railway, and is set in 1873. It closed to passenger traffic in 1885 and was redeveloped as a goods depot. The station was located on the south bank of the Thames and the then new Blackfriars Bridge had just been completed, providing a link to the north via the widened lines to the Great Northern and Midland Railways who contributed to the cost of the bridge. The LSWR also contributed to the cost and in return gained running rights to Ludgate Hill. Thus traffic through Blackfriars Bridge could originate from any of these railways, giving operational diversity and interest. The track plan is based on mapping available at the time of building the layout, but subsequent research has shown it to be incomplete. Trains operate from the fiddle yard to the right, passing through the station throat into a second fiddle yard in the station platform area which is hidden from view by the station frontage. All the operational action takes place in the station throat. This connects three platform lines through the station to four operational lines going south towards Elephant and Castle. Starting from the left we have the main station building. The magnificent station frontage, designed by Joseph Cubitt, attracts the eye. The station platforms span Holland Street, and it is this section where the station roof is fully modelled. Underneath the station there is a goods depot, with a wagon posed outside. This is accessed via wagon lifts on the far side of the station, the structures of which can just be glimpsed through the portals in this wall. Moving along the model, we have the Iron Girder Bridge over Southwark Street. Notice the fly posters on the abutment. In some parts taken to extreme, posters on top of posters, with someone adding even more. On the opposite side of the busy street, there are plenty of pedestrians, groups of children and people chatting. On the south side of Southwark Street, there is a zigzag carriage access ramp from street level up to station platform level. This has wooden strips in the sets to provide additional grip for horses' hooves when pulling carriages up the steep slope. From here to the fiddle yard there is a section of plain viaduct. This is modelled with businesses being established in the arches, shown here by the construction of an infill brick wall. The brickwork is finely detailed with dentils and parapet walls being crisply executed and accurately represented. Signalling provided is appropriate for the period, modelled with signal arms operating in slots and mounted above the cabin. It really looks quite minimalist by today's standards. As was the practice during this era, ballast covers the sleepers and is quite fine which suggests gravel or shingle rather than angular crushed stone. It is noticeable looking across the layout that some ballast is very clean, other areas are fouled, indicating where track work is being altered, with gangers busy on the relaying. 
One of the best features of the layout is the variety of rolling stock that can be run, with locomotives and coaches from the four companies with running rights, as well as good vehicles from all over. First up is from the LSWR, with a BT well tank painted chocolate brown and coaches in salmon and brown. Next we have an LCDR train heading south towards Elephant and Castle with a reindeer class at the front. Here we have a rake of four wheelers behind an LCDR Ruby class loco arriving from Elephant and Castle. Note the new ballast just in front of the camera where there is relaying work in progress. Finally, a train going past the turntable headed by Scotchman class 042 Jura. It was interesting to see this layout with such a variety of early rolling stock from different railway companies. Just behind Blackfriars Bridge was the Prickly Pear product stand. Amongst the many other kits they were showing was this new one for a North British wagon. Diagram 26. On the corner was Cambrian Models, offering a wide range of kits and materials from Parkside and Slaters, as well as their own kits. They also continue to make available stock from the much missed Eileen's Emporium, seen here on the left. Next along was Rumney Models, showing their kits with a mixture of etched and 3D printed components. Also promoted were a variety of new products, including Loco Bogies, a GWR Bogie Mink F, and Loco Underframes. Just round the corner was Model Railway Developments, offering their range of etches and white metal castings. Finally in this part, we come to the high level stand, showing their various gearboxes and motors. That concludes part three of the Scale Forum report, covering the first half of the sports hall. In the next part, we will take a look around the remainder of this hall.